Greetings class of 2021, juniors, the best class on campus. Don't ever forget that. This is Mr. Patterson and Mrs. Duenas, your favorite GLCs. We're your only GLCs, but we're your favorite, we hope. Um, this is the first video message in a series of about five video messages that we're going to be producing and sharing with you in the next two to three weeks. They're very, very important that you take ownership of them and you take responsibility for watching and learning the material that's in them so that you have a very productive and successful summer in pre uh, preparing for whether it's college applications, job preparation, whatever your next step is after high school. The first video presentation that you're gonna see is a post high school option. So we need you to pay attention to it. We want you to pay very close attention to details as you start your search for post high school options. We went over these options at the end of your sophomore year. We had a lunch meeting, if you recall. Well, let me clarify that. 124 of the 620 of you will recall, because that's all that showed up at that meeting. Not to say that I'm still you know, not happy with that, but it just sticks in my uh, memory that 124 of you will remember this first video. But the rest of you will be able to see it for the first time. This is going to open up our video presentation. All right, let me just, okay, here we go. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. 13? But did you see the moonwalking bear? <laughs> no! All right, why would I show you this? If we're going to talk about college admissions and standardized testing, why, why, why would we open with that? Anybody want to guess? I think we ever focus on the wrong things when it, comes, when it comes to this. And a lot of time we get caught up in keeping score. Did I score higher than Sally or Norman? Are they going to get in a better school than me? Oh my gosh, he's so smart. He's going to get in everywhere. I won't. Lots of sources of anxiety there and none of it really matters. None of it matters. I mean, the only thing that when it comes to, especially the standardized test scores, it's just a means to an end. Um, let's go with the adults here. I mean, raise your hand if your SAT score ever got you a job or help you made a mortgage payment or really anything of usefulness. I, no, no, of course not. They're, the scores are just means to an end to get you to the next step in your life. And this whole rankings thing is a little misguided because I really don't think, let's see, what's your name right here? All right, so that kind of gets us prepared for this whole video message series, the college and career series of messages. We want you to pay attention to what's the right thing to pay attention to, to you and to your happiness and to finding a place that fits you. And don't worry about the other folks, your peers, your parents, your brothers and sisters and what they might have done. So this whole process that we're gonna take you along here in the next two or three weeks, getting you ready for the summer and fall is, is just that. Let's fine tune what you're looking for so that you find a good fit for your life. You're starting your adult life after high school. All right, so let's go to the next slide. We're gonna have Ms. Duenas go over some of the topics. All right, guys. So there's a lot of things to consider here in the next year or so um, as far as what you can do with your post high school options. And so we've kind of listed a few things here that maybe you're thinking about already, possibly going into work full time. Are you thinking about potentially a gap year where you take a year off and, and maybe focus on a couple of things before starting your college career? Are you thinking about military service, trade or technical schools? Um, are you thinking of doing a two year community college and then transferring on to a four year school? Um, there's lots of things here at play. And so we're going to kind of talk a little bit about each of these just to give you a little bit more clarity um, and hopefully help you make an informed decision. 
So working full time. So the biggest thing with this, there's a lot of successful people that have left high school and maybe they run a great business and, and they didn't go to college and they decided to focus their efforts in working full time right out the gate. And more power to them. But the biggest, most important thing with that plan is you have to have a long-term plan, okay? There's a lot of kids that get excited about the money that they make right out of high school. This is the first time you're, you're earning an income, um, whether it's waiting tables or working in a retail shop. Seeing actual money come in can sometimes be too exciting and you start losing sight of a long-term plan. So if you're thinking about working full-time, that's something that we definitely wanna encourage you to do with the appropriate long-term plan. So really start thinking about your options. What would your career choices be as you progress through that plan? Um, and, and just making sure that you know the difference between good money at 18 or 20 years old versus good money later in life that's gonna take you into retirement and things like that. So um, thinking about that when you're thinking about working full time. A gap year. So this is something that's kind of been newer in the last uh, few years. Some students are choosing to take a gap year for a variety of reasons, um, but it has allowed students to take a year to travel, um, to volunteer, to take a job at a specific place, um, learn a new language. We listed a couple different reasons there as to why some people have opted for, an, for a gap year. And for a lot of individuals, the gap year has been essential to helping them grow into the adult that they are becoming. Um, so it's definitely something that you need to think long and hard about. Um, the state of affairs that we're currently in may decide for you whether you want to take a gap year or not. In light of COVID-19 and all these stay-at-home orders, I think traveling is going to be really tough um, and there's job shortages. So if this is something that you have your heart set on, make sure it's a discussion that you have thoroughly with parents, with people that you love and care about you um, so you can make an informed decision regarding a gap year. Military service, okay? So we are always so thankful for those that choose to serve in our military. This is a huge calling for those of you that are considering a military service um, career or stint for post high school. Um, it's something you need to discuss with parents or guardians. Um, we typically at Diamond Bar, sorry, I'm trying not to get cast behind my flowers here. Uh, at Diamond Bar, we'll have different reps come. Um, being that we've been at home for the last couple months, that's a little difficult, but hopefully in senior year, um, you'll have exposure back at the school. There's different reps from different military branches that come to our campus. You've probably seen them doing like the pull-up challenge or something during lunch, um, but they're great people to talk to if you are even considering military in the slightest. Converse with them, ask questions. They will have a lot of answers for you as to what military service looks like, what are the steps you need to take to, to get in, and which branch might be the most appropriate branch for you. Um, so just some information there about military service. And then trade technical schools. So some of you may be thinking about doing a career like respiratory therapist. Okay, That is a very skilled individual who has to work at a hospital or um, a skilled nursing center of some sort, and they're completely trained to deal with respiratory issues, okay? So they're working with machines and all kinds of stuff. They are not going to a four-year school to get a degree in that field, but they are going to a program, a trade type of program that is gonna give them a certificate or some kind of completion um, for that particular trade. And so we've listed a few things there just to give you an example of what we're talking about, auto mechanic, refrigerator repair, lineman, dental hygienist, electrician, like I said, respiratory therapist. These are great jobs, guys, and they're jobs that are many times in very high demand, and they make a very good living. So great things to think about. It's not the same route that you're gonna be taking for a college degree, but they are, you are gonna be getting some sort of education to make you a skilled professional in that particular field. So things to consider for trade and technical schools there. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about community college. Um, we, Mr. Patterson and I, you guys know by now, we are huge advocates of the community college. We think that um, it's a great place 
to go. It's a great place to start. Whether you are a 4.0 valedictorian and you are going to be go there and get your business done and then transfer, or you missed every opportunity in high school and you've turned your life around after graduation, you said, I'm going to go and I, I want to you know, have the opportunity to go to a four-year school and you start at the community college, they're great resources. Okay, so just some of the bullets that we've listed here. Um, it's a great, you go and you get your general education done. So we've said this a few times for a few of you who might be confused. Community college, it's, it's about a two-year stint where you go and you get all of your general education done. Then you transfer to a four-year school. You don't transfer and do another four years. Okay, you do two years at the community college and two years at the four-year school. Um, and then you've essentially completed the bachelor's program, hopefully in about that time frame. Um, but the community college, you're doing two years of general ed. When kids apply to four-year schools, so let's say, for example, they're going to UC Riverside, their first two years of that four-year program is all general ed classes. So essentially, you have the option to do that at a community college. Um, they also offer a number of certificate programs that take anywhere from one to two years. Um, benefits can include smaller class sizes. So sometimes when you go to a large university, you are in a lecture hall of 400 people. Community colleges can sometimes offer much smaller classes. There's a lot more personalization with professors, um, dedicated professors who usually have work experience in their subject. Sometimes it's the same professors that are teaching at the local university down the street, they're also teaching at the community college. So the same lesson for a lot less money. So the next bullet there is cost. Um, you'll save a great deal of money by going to community college versus going straight into a four-year school. And there's great transfer success stories from, from community college to four-year schools. They have a lot of programs. There's a transfer center where you can go and figure out a perfect plan to get you from point A to point B being whatever four-year school it is that you want to attend. Um, they also have honors programs for those of you that don't want to get, you know, lost in the shuffle there. Honors programs are great. They give you priority registration and they keep you regimented in your work so that you can get in and get your classes and still be feeling like you're held to a very uh, prestigious rigor. They're a great option. Um, community college continued. So we have the California Community Colleges. Um, it's, these are the, the community college for, for the state of California, and it is the largest system of higher education in the United States. So if you see there, it says that they serve more than 2.1 million students at 114 campuses across California. So we have a huge community college offering um, and, and just great programs at those schools. And then just to highlight, these would be some great choices if you're thinking about community college. These are some of the local ones. Luckily, we're located somewhere where there's access to kind of a lot of them. So we have Mount Sac, which is located in Walnut. We have Fullerton College in Fullerton, Rio Hondo College in Whittier, Citrus College in Glendora, and Chafee College in Rancho Cucamonga. So lots of places for you to look into if that's something that you're considering. All right, Mr. Patterson. All right. For your universities. Now, so let's say that you are looking at right after high school, starting at a four year university. Perfect. That's a good plan. If it fits what you're looking for, there's usually three major components that any four year university is going to be looking at uh, when they're looking at admitting students from high school. They're looking at your academic course requirements. Did you take the right classes? Now for us here in California, you're all familiar with the Cal State and the UC A through G course requirements. So as long as you're, you're meeting those requirements, you've met the minimum requirements, you can be a candidate at a CSU and a UC. The second thing they'll look at will be your grades in these courses. Now for the general rule of thumb, 10th and 11th grade, definitely for Cal States and UCs, but also most universities in America, they're gonna be looking at the courses and the GPA that you earn in 10th and 11th grade in those academic oriented classes. And then they'll be looking at standardized test scores, the SAT and or the ACT. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is a big uh, hot item right now in the news as everybody is hearing. You know, a lot of the universities with the COVID-19 pandemic situation that we're all under have gone test optional. 
UCs and Cal States for your class, the class of 21, have gone test optional. All right, so I'll explain what that means in a moment. Um, test optional versus test blind. What does test optional mean? Cal State's UCs, test optional, that means that if you did not take the SAT or ACT, you will still be able to apply to a Cal State and UC. You're not missing a requirement, all right? If you have already taken the SAT, or as Mrs. Duenas and I conservatively are advising everybody, we're really advising you to still take the SAT. If you, if you prep for it and you're ready for it, go ahead and follow through with signing up for the August, September, no, uh, October, November test dates, whatever is left. Go ahead and still take those exams because Cal States and UCs being test optional, if you submit a score, it could possibly help you with admissions, all right? It's a little bit of a vague term, in my opinion, test optional. I say if it's test optional, conservatively advising you to take it is the right way to go, in my opinion. Just continue to go ahead and take it and submit it. Now, test blind is completely different. Test blind, when you read of a school being test blind, that means you can send them your score, but they're not going to look at it. They'll just set it aside. They're not even going to look at it. Not as many universities are coming out test blind for your class of 21. It's more test optional. So our advice to you is, is proceed as you have been proceeding. Look at the SAT, take the SAT and prepare for it and submit your scores. The other reason is that's just Cal State and UCs. If you find a university over the course of the summer when you're researching other schools, you might find a school out of state a private school out of state or something, and they might have a requirement of the SAT or ACT, and we'd like you to have that tool to be able to give to them. Other things that they'll look at when you apply, obviously, extracurricular involvement. Now, the Cal States won't look at your extracurricular activities. The Cal States are pretty numbers oriented. They'll look at your, your uh, GPA and your courses and SATs as a test optional format. They don't look at any other uh, extracurriculars. There's no place on the application to put it. UCs, on the other hand, there are definitely sections of the UC application where you're putting all of your extracurricular activities. That is a big part of their application in their comprehensive review format of admissions. They like kids that have shown some leadership experience. Uh, they like the fact that uh, how you respond to the essay questions, their, their personal insight questions is what the UCs use. There's eight of those questions. You're going to need to respond to four of those. And we hit on this topic very, very detail-wise in the admissions message that we'll send you in a couple weeks. So I'll just touch on it now. You're going to have some essay questions to do for the UCs. There's eight of them, eight prompts, and you're going to answer four of them. Cal State's quick review, 23 campuses. They're admitting about the top 33% of uh, high school students, the top students, 33%. They'll look at the GPA, SAT, ACT optional, extracurricular activities, not part of the application as a summary. UCs, there's nine undergraduate campuses. There's, a, there's actually 10 UC campuses. You see San Francisco is more of a graduate school. The goal of the UC is to admit the top nine to 12 percent of the high school class. They're going to look at the GPA, the SAT, ACT optional, definitely look at extracurricular activities and the personal insight questions. Again, four of the eight need to be answered. Private universities. Private universities can be in state or they could be out of state. Generally, what we've always advised our students if you're meeting the A through G course requirements for the Cal States and UCs, we're very fortunate that the Cal States and UC requirements, the A through Gs are pretty good. They're, they're very strong. And if you've met those requirements, the minimum and even above the recommended ones that the UCs recommend, you're in pretty good shape for most private universities in the country. As you start researching that, you will learn that firsthand. Why private school versus public? That, that's something that we're gonna talk in detail in searching for a college and um, making your list in another video message, which is down the road another week or two. 
but private universities, many times they provide a smaller campus. Not all the time, but many times private schools are, might be a little bit smaller. They might not have 20, 25, 30,000 students. It might be a very small, cozy campus of, of 2,000 students. Um, probably one of the big things is that everybody kind of realizes, well, public schools aren't as expensive as private universities, and that's 100% accurate. But keep in mind, a private university might be more expensive. The price tag might be higher, but the private universities pretty much always have a more generous financial aid program than public universities. Private universities have more merit-based financial aid to present to you. So let's say you uh, apply to a private university and it costs $60,000 to go to that university. You apply, you get accepted. With your acceptance, they're gonna send you a financial aid package. They might provide to you let's say $35,000, all right? $35,000 of merit-based aid, grant aid. That means you don't have to pay it back. So in my simple brain, 60 minus 35, that's $25,000 that it's gonna cost you out of your pocket or your parents' pocket to pay for that university. Now, when you weigh that against a public university that you apply to and get accepted to, you have to look at the bottom line of the public university's financial package. They might not offer you nearly as much. Let's say a UC cost about $35,000 to go to it. They only give you $5,000 in merit-based aid. Now you have a price tag of about $30,000 out of pocket. So you can see that a private university many times might be cheaper to go to than a public school, but follow through with it. My big message there is, don't eliminate a private school from your list of colleges. If it has everything you want, pursue it. Don't eliminate it just because of the big price tag. Now, in March and April, when you get the decisions of your senior year, you might have to make a decision. It still costs too much. We can't afford it. But that will be later on. Okay? Does that make sense? Out-of-state colleges. Sometimes, obviously, when you go to a school out-of-state, Private schools are pretty much the same price tag for in-state or out-of-state students. But let's say you go to a public university out-of-state, like Arizona State University, for example, or, uh, oh, that's probably the best example. Let's say you go to Arizona State University. They might have a program called the Western Undergraduate Exchange. And what that does is it, it reduces the amount it costs for an out-of-state student. So let's say I'm a Californian. I apply to a university in Arizona, Arizona State, it might cost me one and a half times the price that it cost an in-state student. So I might have to play, pay the full tuition plus half of that to go there. Now the WUE program might reduce that cost to where it's like an in-state student. So definitely do some research on the Western Undergraduate Exchange Program and see what Western universities in the Western United States are part of that program. It could benefit you and your family with tuition. Standardized test, let's revisit that really quickly. Um, the Cal State requires the SAT or the ACT. Always do the writing of the essay component with both tests. Um, almost all the Cal States will accept either the ACT or the SAT. There are some campuses that prefer the SA or the ACT over the SAT. Cal Poly San Luis Obispo jumps to mind. Um, they like that. They'll accept both. You need to do your research. You need to make sure that you know what campus would prefer one or the other. I think you're pretty safe with the SAT across the board, but when you do your research, you'll find out if the ACT is a preference and they can always add that to your options. But right now, as everybody knows, test optional, but as we mentioned a little bit earlier, we still would advise you conservatively to proceed with the test. You see campuses, the SAT with the writing, ACT with the writing, same format. You want to do the writing with both. Uh, they'll accept either of those tests. Again, it's test optional with the COVID-19. Uh, the UCs kind of throw us a curveball, and your class is still involved with this. The UCs have very recently, yesterday, just made some changes, but it doesn't really involve our class other than it's test optional for you guys. The UC campuses don't require what's called the SAT subject test. 
They don't require them, but they recommend them. I do the air quote thing with that. They recommend them. So for example, you're probably all familiar with the SAT subject test. It's basically a one hour test on one subject. It's like taking a math test in your math class. They wanna see how much math you know, for example. You would need to take two subject tests for certain majors at certain UC campuses. So UCs don't require the subject test, but they recommend that you take two subject tests for certain majors. Bottom line is this, if you're looking at a STEM major, and you're looking at going to one of the UCs, you should probably plan on taking the SAT subject test, math level two, and one of the science exams. And then the out-of-state school is the same thing. I'll kind of touch on that right now. Out-of-state universities and private schools, we can go to the next one, Steph. They will probably have um, SAT subject test requirements. A lot of private schools require subject tests. Again, STEM majors, tend to want you to have a math level two and a science. Other majors might say any two subject tests that you want to take, we'll accept, okay? And keep in mind, do your research, find out which schools require which tests. Timing of these tests. Uh, I hit that earlier. It's, it's something that we want to be conservative. We want to protect you. And if you were already in the process of preparing and taking the, to, to uh, take the SAT or ACT, I think it's full steam ahead. You go ahead and still take it. If you choose not to, then you're still a candidate for the Cal State and UC. It's not like you're uh, out of the running. You can still pursue, but I think conservatively, you should still probably go ahead and take the darn thing. Now, keep in mind the timing of test two. Some universities will not accept the December test. As you know, you can still take the test in December, or, or excuse me, in your senior year. Um, a lot of you would be done with your test if it was a regular situation and we didn't have to close everything down. Some of you would have your whole series of SATs done. That was your plan. Well, those plans had to change, obviously. So keep in mind, seniors, you can still take the SAT and ACT. They have several tests. The College Board has added the SAT for September, that's an additional test, but you need to do your research. If you're planning on waiting until December to take one of these tests, please research the universities to make sure they'll still accept the December score. And the other thing I'll mention, don't freak out saying, wait a minute, if I take it in December, but I submit my application in November, what happens? Trust me, the scores will go to the right people in the right, on the right timing uh, platform. They'll get the score, so don't panic about that but do your research about December to make sure your school's accepted. Okay, to touch a little bit about extracurricular activities. Um, you know, we've been encouraging you guys to find things that you're passionate about and get after them and just make sure that you are not only enjoying your time in high school, but really making, making yourself Gosh, just when I start talking, I start getting behind these flowers. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, marketing yourself in the best possible way. And so being involved in activities is important. It's important for a lot of admissions. We talked about how CSUs aren't necessarily looking at that, but for sure for UCs, private schools, they're looking to see what you've done beyond just your grades. Um, so again, if you haven't already, guys, we find something that makes you tick. Okay, something that you're passionate about, you love doing, and focus on that and really give time and commitment to that. Um, the biggest thing that we want to emphasize when it comes to extracurriculars, though, is quantity versus quality. Okay, so there are some kids that are out there thinking, okay, if I'm part of 10 clubs and I did the marching band and I'm doing the soccer team and I am going for USB and you're just, you're spread so thin you're giving very little of yourself to each of those things, okay? You wanna give the most of yourself to the things that really matter. So quality versus quantity, okay? That's what we're really encouraging you guys to think about, less is more. And so yeah, extracurricular examples there, just a few are listed, clubs on campus, on or off campus, any music, part-time employment, that counts, guys. When you have a job, you're responsible. There's somebody who is, checking to make sure that you're doing your daily duties at this job. Um, 
having employment, it, it's, it goes a long way. It speaks volumes about your character. And then volunteer work. Okay, so those are just some uh, examples of extracurricular activities. And then leadership. So what we've been hearing, oh, sorry, Mr. Patterson, go ahead. You know, just I'll, I'll just really quickly input, sorry, Mrs. Duane. No, that's Don't okay. Don't minimize your, your, your work, meaning this kids. If you have done babysitting, well, that's not really a job. Yes, it is. It's, it's a job. Uh, you have responsibilities as your older sibling that you're, you are responsible for your younger siblings in the afternoon. Those are things that not only show leadership, but they show responsibility. Babysitting, lawn mowing, whatever it might be, watching somebody's house over the summer, vacation, house watching, don't minimize those opportunities. Right, you, you put the work in and that's you and that's what they wanna see. Absolutely. Um, so this next slide, we hear a lot about how colleges don't just wanna hear about all the things that you did. They wanna hear about how you were a leader in any of those things. And I'll, I'll touch a little bit about other examples of leadership, but you know, talk about in, in the essays that you write, they wanna hear about how you have stepped up above and beyond your peers to lead a group. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean that you were president of the club on campus or you, know, you were captain of the varsity team. That It's not necessarily asking for that. Um, you can give a lot of different examples. And so we've listed a few. <laughs> I get distracted by you. Um, you know, if you were in a class and you led a group discussion, if you were a group leader for a project in a class, talk about that. Really emphasize how your role was pivotal in making a difference for your group and turning in assignments and, and getting the grade that you guys were all hoping for. Leading a fundraising activity. If you're the shift lead at your job, group leader at your church. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways. <laughs> To be a leader without having to be the president or the captain of a specific group, okay? Just think about times that you have been called to step above and beyond and to help lead a particular group of people or your peers. Okay, Mr. Patterson. All right, your list of potential schools, and we're going to hit on this in a, a video message here in another week or two, very, very detail-wise. I'll touch on it briefly, but as you start listing your potential schools, if you have not already started, start, but we'll hit on the details here in another week or two. You know, visit campus virtually. It's not the same as if you're getting out and actually visiting campuses in person. So there's a little bit of difference, but in the uh, future video, I'm gonna give you some, some ways to, to visit and prepare yourself and get the same type of experience, hopefully virtually. Um, we kind of stick with the eight to 10 numbers of schools that you should apply to. So as you start developing a list of universities that you'll apply to, eight to 10 is a good number. It's gonna vary a little bit here and there. What you wanna avoid is the shotgun approach and not apply to, hey, I applied to 30 schools. You know, very, very likely you don't know where some of those schools even exist or what state they're in. And you haven't really done your research and you're just throwing your name in the hat everywhere you can. And I don't know if that's the best strategy or the wisest strategy, because you might get in and that could be a bad thing because you don't like it there. So eight to 10 schools, numbers are gonna vary. We kind of split it up into groups and we say anywhere from two to four schools in each group. When you make a list, you don't wanna have 10 schools that are all similar as far as how difficult they might be get, able to get uh, admitted to. So we have you make a list of safety schools, target schools, and reach schools. So safety schools would be schools that based on your research, all your numbers, your GPA, the courses you've taken, SAT scores or projected scores, you're, you're over the main averages. You're over the middle of the group that they've accepted at that university in the past year. So you can do your research to find where you fit in with past um, students that have been accepted. Those are safety schools. Two to three of your schools should be safety for sure. Target schools, would be schools, universities that your GPA test scores, you fit right smack dab in the middle of those averages, those numbers. And it's a good shot that you would get accepted. You're right in the middle of those averages, three to four uh, schools that fit in this, the target category. And then you definitely wanna throw in some reach schools. These can be schools that are dream schools, 
schools that the numbers are really, really high, you might be under the GPA average, you might be under the SAT average, but keep in mind, those publicized numbers are ranges, they're averages. And so for every 1500 SAT, there's gonna be probably 12, a 1200, a 1250, 1100. They're averages. If there's a 1450 average, you might have a 1200 student SAT score get in. So don't freak out about those. REACH schools would be schools that just have a low admissions percentage, but don't give up on those. Give them a shot and see what happens. As long as you meet the minimum requirements, give it a shot. But the bottom line is this, and I go into detail this in the, in the video message in the future here, every school that's on your list of 10 should be schools that you would go to and you would say, it's got everything I'm looking for. And I hit on that later on, but don't apply to schools just, oh, I'm gonna get in there, I'm just gonna apply to it. And then when it comes down to it, if that's the only school you got into, are you gonna be happy saying yes and go there? So every one of your 10 schools on this final list should be schools that you would say, you know what, I'm gonna be happy there. It has the main things I'm looking for. Stay tuned for the video message. I think it's number three. We're gonna hit that in detail. Think about the following. Um, you know, where you attend college is not gonna define you. I'm actually reading a book. Let me show you. This is one of the things I'm doing during the break. Oh, you probably can't see it. It says, where you go is not who you'll be. All right, it's a very, very good book. And where you go to college is not gonna define you as a person. You wanna find a school that just fits you. And again, in the next uh, future video, we're gonna hit on that. Just find a place that fits you. Don't worry about what it you know, means to your friend or whomever else. It doesn't matter. It matters if you find a place that fits you, be excited about it, go for it. Make a plan. DPP, like we always say, dream, plan, pursue it with passion. Go for your plan. You might make plan A. You might have to bounce back and do plan B, but that's okay as long as you're always following a direction, a plan. Don't worry about your fellow students. Be the best that you can be. You get in trouble when you start comparing yourself to other people. Oh, this person has this many, many APs or this score. Don't worry about that stuff. Be the best you. That's the most important thing. And the last thing in this slide is find something you're good at and find something you enjoy doing. I mean, isn't that the secret of life, guys and gals? Aren't we all looking for something that we dig doing and we want to do it every day and we want to go to work and do that job? I feel as fortunate as anybody in the world. I love what I do. I look forward to going to work or to my office in the last two months every day to, to interact with kids, interact with staff and my partner. So. Find something you're good at. We go into details on that in a future video and you enjoy doing it and then pursue it. Ms. Duenas, is this you? No, or this is me, I'm sorry. So sorry, I, I, I had a moment. Uh, second semester grades, last couple of things, uh, audience here. End of semester, summer and registration. Uh, if this is viewed before June 8th, obviously, when summer school starts. But if you earn an F in a graduation requirement, an F, not a D minus or a D or a D plus, but if you fail with an F in English class or your modern American history class, those are classes you have to pass to graduate. All right, we're gonna do our best to try to catch that, but the timing of getting the final transcript and getting to you and the uh, notifying you and so on and so forth might be tricky before June 8th when summer school actually starts. Summer school is all online this summer, but there's still possibilities for you to take a class, especially in the English area and possibly modern American history. So if you end up with an F in a graduation requirement and Mrs. Duenas and I have not intervened with you or contacted you, reach out to us between the end of school, May 28th and before June 8th and we'll see what we can do. If we can't get you into summer school, then we'll do some rallying and we'll figure out what we need to do in the fall to get those credits back up and running, okay? Now I know civics and econ is closed for the summer, um, but I know we could get kids into English and possibly modern American history if necessary. Yeah. And a couple more things for end of summer registration. Other things to do with your grades, your second semester grades. If you know, 
that you did not meet a prerequisite for a course. Let's say you applied for a, an AP course. Um, well, let's say this, I'll just use AP Science. You applied for AP Bio for the fall and you have to have an A or a B in your chemistry class. Let's say you ended up with a C or a C plus in chemistry. Well, you fell short of the prerequisite for your AP Science class. Now, you guys need to know what the prerequisites are. They're in the course description book book on the way, our webpage if you need to look. But if you fell short of the prerequisite, please alert us. Let us know. We'll do one of two things. We'll adjust your course request where you're not taking the class you asked for, or if it's something that we can advocate for you and we think there's a chance you might still be able to get in based on the dean, and uh, the dean would make the final decision, we'll advocate for you in that case, especially with this COVID-19 semester being a little bit wonky. All right, but please let us know. Don't let it be a surprise. If you wait and just tell us when we sit down in the GLC meeting and say, surprise, then we might have to make adjustments in your schedule when we're sitting there with you. Guys, we're in this together, all right? This was one of the longer video messages that we're going to provide to you, but we thought it was very important to cover the post high school options. We're here to support you. Please, please, please share this with your parents. Watch it, share it with your peers. And if you have questions, we're, we're doing office hours. So please log into those office hours. If something wasn't clear, we wanna make sure we address those things with you then. Yeah, the next Tuesdays all the way through June 16th, every Tuesday from two to three office hours, the Zoom link will be on the webpage. All right, guys, see you later.